Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our program. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from Julie Morgan-Lender, who is editor of the book, The Things We Don't Say, an anthology of chronic illness truths about how we define chronic illnesses, how they differ and overlap with disability, and the realities of people's experiences. My name is Susan Eastland. I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the program. Um, and this program is being recorded and it will be posted to the Cary Library's YouTube channel um, within a week. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Julie Morganlender is a friend, daughter, aunt, crocheter, reader and creator of this anthology that we're going to be talking about, um, and she has lived most of her life with chronic illnesses. She enjoys walking in the sunshine, crafting, and spending time with awesome people. She volunteers for a chronic pain support group and is on the board of directors of the Bisexual Resource Center. Julie lives in Massachusetts with her adorable Shih Tzu Larry, and now I'm just going to hand it off to Julie. Julie, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here today, Susan, and thank you all of you who are attending today. Um, okay, so first, disclaimer, I'm not a medical professional. Nothing I'm saying is to be considered as medical advice. So now that that's out of the way, um, please put, like Susan said, put any questions that you have in the chat. I will answer some as we go along, and I'll certainly answer them at the end. Um, there will be plenty of time for a Q&A and no question is out of bounds here. Um, all the questions you've always wanted to ask about chronic illness, this is the time for it. And even if you don't have a question, I'd love to know why you're here. Um, do you have a chronic illness? Do you have a loved one with chronic illness? Do you work in the community? Do you have questions? Are you looking for community, solidarity? Whatever it is, please put it in there. So I'd love to um, just know why you're here. So uh, Susan gave me a great introduction. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julie. I go with she, her pronouns. And I am a person with multiple chronic illnesses and disabilities. I've had symptoms since I was a child. I got my first, we'll say, diagnosis, even though it was very vague, at the age of 23. And I continue to get more diagnoses into my 30s and now in my 40s as well. Um, unfortunately, having multiple chronic illnesses is somewhat common. Um, because, you know, in the non-technical sense, once your body's out of whack in one way, it can be out of whack in others. Our bodies are very finely tuned. And often the things that cause one chronic illness can also cause others as well. Um, I, I also do other things. So as Susan mentioned, I knit and crochet. I have an adorable dog who's sleeping right now, and I'm going to hope he stays that way for the rest of tonight. Um, I read a lot. I spend time with my family and with, with my friends. And I think it's so important to point that out because so often we define ourselves by our chronic illness or others define us by our chronic illness. And it's important to remember that we are whole people. We have lives, we have interests, we have hobbies, we have people we care about, we have things that we enjoy. Um, sometimes we can't do some of those things, but we find other things. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I am putting a, a quick link in the chat because as a test, um, my drop down is making it look like I might not be able to share the link. So please, someone let me know if you're able to see that. Um, and just so you know, when you post in the Q&A, no one other than myself and Susan see it. So, and it is showing up as anonymous. So uh, you don't have to worry about that either. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do here. We're gonna talk about chronic illness and disability as Susan mentioned. I'm gonna read a few short passages from my book and um, then we'll do the Q and A. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> Susan's telling me I can change my settings. Um, unfortunately, it gives me no options to do that. So I might not be able to share links tonight. Okay, so um, you can just share them with me and then I'll share them with everyone else. Okay. Excellent, thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, so what counts as chronic illness? Well, that's a complicated question that I get asked a lot. Um, a chronic illness has a definition from the government if they want to know if you qualify as disabled for benefits purposes, and then you must ask which government 
what country are you living in, what state? Um, but for my purposes, for the purposes of this book, I got asked that a lot. A lot of people said, does what I have count as a chronic illness? And that made me really sad because we've been made so much by society to doubt ourselves that people even had to question. Um, and my response was always, if you consider it a chronic illness, then it is. Because I have never met anyone who wants to identify as having chronic illness who doesn't actually have one. Um, it's an illness that is chronic. So this is not something that is quickly curable. There is no quick treatment for it. You don't take a medication and get better in a few weeks or a few months. It is something that's going to last ongoing. So as I mentioned, I've had symptoms since I was a child and I refer to my received my first diagnosis um, about 20 years ago. Now I think about it, 2003, I think. Um, so it's, these are things that can last for quite a long time, often for the rest of one's life. Um, and then a lot of people want to know if chronic illness and disability are the same, and they're not. Um, if there were Venn diagram though, they would overlap quite a bit, um, but there are also a lot of differences. So um, let's see. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting very distracted by this Q&A. It's not the setup I'm used to. I'm gonna get better at that. Um, okay, so chronic illness I touched on. Disability has more to do with um, ability, right? And so sometimes the result, the cause of one can have the result of the other. So a chronic illness could be the cause that could lead to disability. For example, your chronic illness could cause you to have difficulty walking. That could be a disabling condition. Your chronic illness could lead to cognitive impairment and that could be disabling. However, that's not always the case. Um, somebody could be disabled after being in a car accident, for example. Um, they do have some things in common. You can have an invisible chronic illness. I don't love that term invisible though because so often these things are visible if you know what to look for. Um, somebody might be looking at me right now thinking I look totally fine but um, somebody who knows me well might notice that my cheeks are very red. That's not makeup. That's my body having trouble regulating temperature right now. Um, um, or they, they might notice something else, a twitch or a movement. Um, I'll sometimes notice somebody wince and I can tell they're in pain when no one else notices it because after so many years, I'm very attuned to that. So often these things that we call invisible illnesses aren't really so invisible, similar with invisible disabilities. Um, you know, like I said, a cognitive impairment might not be as obvious as say a wheelchair or a, a walker. So it's very important not to judge people. Um, if somebody says they have a chronic illness or disability, we need to believe that. Um, if somebody gets out of a car having parked in a disabled parking spot and they have put up the Picard, even if they look fine, let's believe them because we don't know what their disability is that might cause them to need that closer parking spot, even if it's not something that is obvious to somebody else. Um, so for those of us with physical health, chronic illnesses, mental health, chronic illnesses, um, there are some things that a lot of us experience um, that are, I wouldn't say universal, but we'll say very common. And I like to touch on these. So for example, a lot of us deal with a lot of stigma um, for example, I just mentioned, um, parking in, uh, disabled parking spaces. I know I've gotten nasty looks for that. Uh, people have received comments. They've received, uh, notes on their windshield. I've gotten notes on my windshield. Um, we've been told to just work harder, try harder, just try different medication. Have you tried yoga? What about this diet? Um, this idea that we're not trying hard enough. Um, and that if somebody can't work, for example, that they're being lazy, which is not, not at all accurate. Um, the people I know with chronic illnesses and disabilities are usually very hardworking because we have to work twice as hard to do half as much. Um, the effort it takes for me to go to the grocery store is so much more than it might take for somebody else. The effort that it takes me to be here doing this tonight is so much more than somebody might expect. This right here, this is my energy for the night. This is all I've got in me. It is exhausting. I love it. I love doing these talks, but they are exhausting. Um, and so a lot of us deal with ableism with these ideas that um, these stereotypes that are put on us 
that are just not true. And because they're so prevalent in society, it can be really hard to recognize this ableism for what it is. And so often we've internalized it. Um, whether you become, have a chronic illness that is diagnosed as an adult or as a child, you're still living in a society that most likely is telling you there's something wrong with you on a moral level if you have a chronic illness that you can't seem to recover from. So it's not great. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of trouble accessing care. Um, especially here in the United States where health insurance can be a big issue, but even if you have good health insurance, I have great health insurance and I still have a lot of trouble accessing care sometimes. Um, I live in the Boston area. We have some of the greatest doctors in the world, but they, that is only helpful if you can see the doctors that you need to see when you need to see them. So access to care is a major roadblock for a lot of people, something that um, I've been just talking to so many people about lately. But then there are positives also. Um, so often we find support from places that we wouldn't expect it, um, or even places that we would. We, you can really see the best of people sometimes when they come out and offer love and support and understanding. Um, you know, a, a big difference with a chronic illness is because it's ongoing, it can be hard for loved ones to always be providing support. This isn't a situation where maybe someone brings you dinner a couple times a week for a month or two and then you're better. Because this kind of help can be needed for such a long period of time, people can burn out. And we have to remember that. Um, we can't expect our loved ones to just help us endlessly without you know, ever burning out. But so often we really see people step up and just be understanding in a really special way. Um, so that said, I'm um, going to move along here and just touch on why the book, given all of that. So uh, Susan mentioned the book, The Things We Don't Say. This is it for those who are able to see it. A little bit of a glare, but basically see the cover there. Um, you know, I mentioned the stigma and I felt like when we don't talk about these things, it just makes the stigma worse. But what if we did talk about it? What if we did talk about all these things that are considered either inappropriate or just, we worry that no one will understand. So we just keep our mouth shut. What if we start talking about those things? I, I was writing on a, a blog, an anonymous blog about having chronic illness. And because it was anonymous, I would sometimes write very personal things that felt like maybe I was crossing the line into being too personal, um, or maybe it was just so personal, so specific to me, no one was gonna care. And what I found was that those posts were the ones that got the biggest response, had the most people saying, me too, please talk about this more. And that just showed me how much we do need to talk about these things. There's just so much that's misunderstood or maligned. And I wanted to bring some truth to this um, because I feel like that truth, that knowledge makes such a big difference. And I feel like for anybody reading this who has a chronic illness, it can just help us feel less alone and more understood. Um, because having chronic illness can be so isolating, even though there are a lot of us out there with chronic illnesses. This is unfortunately not all that uncommon, but again, it's not spoken about and there's so many different types of illnesses and we think that maybe what I have with my illness isn't universal. I shouldn't talk to someone else about it. I just felt like we needed to get that understanding up there. So that's why I put together this book. I'm a reader, so book format worked for me. Um, there's an ebook and I'm working on the audiobook now, which I'm hoping to have out in 2024, um, hopefully. And um, there are 50 nonfiction essays in here, true stories by 42 authors from around the world, different ethnicities, ages, races, gender identity, sexual orientations, different chronic illnesses, both mental and physical health. Um, it was really important to me to have as much representation as possible so that Hopefully every reader can see themselves in some part of this book. Um, each essay includes the author's name, location, photo, and a short bio. And again, I just felt that was so important because I want everyone to feel like they can relate. So for those who can see, here's a quick example. And if you go on the website and I will share the link with Susan, who can then share it with all of you. Um, when you go on the website and you look at the authors, um, 
which I don't have the link handy, I apologize. Um, but you, there's, uh, if you go to the about section, just say about the authors, you can read um, each author's bio and see their photo. And I do think that helps with just getting to know everyone a little bit better. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read a couple of passages here and please just put a note in the Q&A. Let me know if these resonate and in what way. Um, oh, actually, take it back. I did put the link here. Past Julie had some forethought, even though current Julie might be a little brain foggy. So I'm gonna put that in the um, chat box. Okay, so I'm gonna read a couple pieces. And uh, these are normally, I think when you do a book reading, um, the author reads a full chapter, but because these are shorter pieces that didn't really make sense. So I'm gonna read um, portions of a few different essays and that way you can get a little sense of what's in, in the book here. And I, I just found each of these to be very um, poignant. So I'm gonna start with one of my own, get it out there, it's by me, <laughs> in Concord, Massachusetts. And it's called, the piece is called, This is Hard. <sighs> Living with chronic illnesses is hard, very hard. That's the part no one wants us to talk about. Instead, society prefers to see us as inspirational. I hear that all the time. How inspirational that I am smiling and laughing when I'm happy, as if they expected, expect me to be sad and crying all the time. How inspirational it is that I am helping a friend with a problem, as if they expect me to spend my days staring at a wall and not talking to anyone. How inspirational it is that I haven't given up, as if they expect me to have killed myself when things first got hard. And you know what, hearing that is hard. I hate it when people tell me how inspirational I am just for living my life. If they want to compliment me for an actual achievement like creating this book, that's great. But I'm insulted and hurt when people tell me how great I am for continuing to live. So I'm going to move on to a piece called, um, oh, sorry. So um, Susan, I'm getting messages from two different people saying they only see my headshot which yeah. is what my audio is and not. Yeah, I'm face. trying to trying to join from okay. another thing to try to figure that out. Okay, I'll let you work on that. I'll keep reading. <laughs> um, okay. And so uh, the next uh, passage is from Anxiety is My Constant Companion by Devin Reynolds in Cedar Falls, Iowa in the US. So Devin wrote, I will never be cured, but denying my illness or trying to quote, defeat it will only ever do more harm than good. I wanted desperately to be normal, but that only left me more vulnerable. My mental illness will always be a part of me, but once I learned to work with my illness instead of against it, I was able to regain control of my life. When I felt a panic attack coming, my natural response was to try to ignore it or prevent it from happening. And this only prolonged the problem. When I acknowledge it and let my brain work through the issues naturally, I can greatly reduce the severity of my attacks and recover faster. It wasn't easy to realize this. It is largely thanks to my medication and the sessions with my therapist. Anxiety is my constant companion. I can never get rid of it, but if I work with it, I can become stronger. If you're dealing with anxiety, I know how hard it can be, but I promise you, if you seek out help and accept anxiety as a natural part of your life, you can still live a fulfilling life. Um, I, I highly recommend, well, I highly recommend all of the, all of the pieces. I think Devin did a really excellent job there talking about anxiety. Um, and I think it's worth reading your piece in full. I'm going to read next from um, An Echo Unheard by Diti Dilip Kumar in IAS Colony, Bangalore, India. So um, Deepti wrote a, a really amazing piece uh, that goes back and forth between the present and some memories and other thoughts. And so um, I'm going to be jumping around as well with it. I'm just taking different pieces um, from her writing, putting them together here. It didn't take me long to realize there was a definite difference between myself and my friends. Though on the surface, everything seemed quote normal. I couldn't muster up the energy to blow balloons for my own birthday party at age nine. I couldn't join in the marching band and drill sessions for sports day and I definitely couldn't take part in the actual events themselves. My motor skills were weak and my coordination was terrible. So even simple games like dodgeball became frightening tasks for me. My handwriting did not stay constant throughout my schooling. 
There was a tremble in my hands because my arms didn't have muscle strength to grip a pen for, a long, for long periods of time. When I was scolded by a teacher or hit, which was common in primary school, my blood pressure would rise beyond all counts and I would faint silently, wetting myself in the process. Throughout the years, my mother pleaded with my teachers that I was a, quote, delicate child, but it fell on deaf ears. I didn't sit in a wheelchair. I didn't wear special devices. My mental development was similar to that of other students in my class. Since my disability was not apparent, I was given no special treatment. I was not a special child in India. I was just another child learning to adapt and be resilient. And then skipping ahead here, she wrote, a few instances of tachycardia, nothing unusual, the doctor says, smiling as he looks over my file. Since your last visit, you're looking so much better. You've put on all the weight you lost from tuberculosis. I am glad to see you looking cheerful again. She's been through a lot, my mother agrees. Constant heart monitoring, monitoring now TB, now weight loss, anemia. She should be proud she's a survivor. I smile, but I do it with some difficulty. If I'm a survivor, why do I feel small and insignificant every day? Why do I feel like my life before me, my future, is like a black cloud in the distance waiting to burst over my head? I don't want to say it out loud, but I know I'm depressed about the person I am and the situation I'm in. Skipping ahead again, I tell the doctor point blank with my mother in the same room that I feel like shit. Sorry, I try to watch my language on these, <clears throat> um, that I feel bad. I feel worthless, like all this, quote, survival has come to nothing. He seems concerned. Aren't you enjoying what you do? You teach children, don't you? Yes, I admit, I love the children, but no one, not the kids, not my colleagues, knows the physical toll it takes on me. The doctor puts his hands together and thinks. Hmm, he says at length, it's a tough situation. I have never felt the need to point out any risks or alarm, or alarm you or your family simply because your positivity all these years has been your wall of immunity. Of course, you will find things difficult. You are quite different. What trouble? What exactly troubles you? This country doesn't have space for someone like me, I spit. I have to put in nine hours of work a day too. I don't get benefits. I don't get any leeway. Being an adult here is tough, but being a silent struggler here is worse. I am filled with anger and bitterness. The doctor smiles sympathetically. I understand, but look at those children out there turning blue, trying to breathe. They fight for survival. You should look at the larger picture instead of focusing on day-to-day -day irritations. Children, all the babies who are with you in the echo room, they deserve to know their fight is worth something, that their fight is valued and respected. You as an adult survivor lead them and give them inspiration. This doesn't seem fair to me. No one is cheerleading me. No one seems to want to inspire me. I try to see the point he makes. As we exit the room, a newborn baby in a stroller coughs up phlegm and cries heartily his lips and little hands blue with effort. My mother stops to tap his chin affectionately and smile at the nervous parents. Do you feel sorry for him? I asked my mother almost jealously. No, she says simply, he'll make it through. I raise my eyebrows at her and she shrugs. Well, you were that little baby once. She sweeps out the hospital, her head held high, her arms clutching the reports that are my actual life story. Single ventricle, BSD, slight tachycardia, lung function compromised 20%, heart function compromised 40%. I follow her out feeling alive again. I think that DT wrote a, um, a longer piece um, and it is so worth reading. I, she just touches on so many things that I, I feel even though my diagnosis is totally different and I live in a completely different part of the world, I can relate to some of those things. Um, Sometimes it does feel hard to look at a future where you can't do any of the things you want to do with your life. Um, and it can definitely be hard to be told that you need to be a role model for other people. Sometimes, sometimes you don't wanna be a role model. Um, but, you know, she found hope in all of that. And I think that's a really amazing thing. So I, I love the way that she wove her story there. Um, we're doing great on time here. So I'm gonna read uh, one or two more pieces. The next one is, and also thank you, Susan, for fixing the video. Um, I'm gonna hold up the book again, since no one saw it before. This is what it looks like. Um, I love what the uh, illustrator did, by the way, with the, the there's, uh, for those who can't see, there is the outline of a face and neck made out of thorns uh, in a sort of tannish color on a blue background. And the titles with inside the face, the things we don't say. 
And I just thought that was um, an amazing representation. Did a good job there. Okay, the next piece is Chronic Pain versus Masculinity by Brett Stevenson in Reno, Nevada in the US. Um, and I actually did an interview with Brett, which is on my YouTube channel as well, if you're interested in taking a look at that. It was very interesting talking with him. So Brett has two pieces in the book and I really like this passage here. What I have learned through all of this is my masculinity, my manhood must be malleable like my overall pride. They all become a luxury at a certain point with necessity dictating when to bend and adapt. Part of my personal growth has been to stop fighting my back issues like a man quote should and just let go of any expectations for my body. A local chronic pain group helps but it took me months to swallow my male pride and walk through the door. The few guys who show, much outnumbered by women, have expressed many of the same feelings as their own personal abilities and dreams were altered by chronic pain. The strong male oak must become a flexible willow. Men do not have to take pain and challenges stoically, especially when they simply cannot. We must let go of all those age old stereotypes and expectations. We need to not get angry when our friends complain of a sore back after golfing or hiking. It's a poor attempt to commiserate, but an attempt nonetheless. Using a cane or butt cushion is not a sign of weakness, just adaptation. Leaving a group early because you can't sit any longer is not a sign of weakness, nor is pulling the social plug completely some days to just try and get through the day and night. I have little to prove as a man at this point in my life. Rather, I've let go of my old manhood and masculinity dogma, and my new goal is to ride this out gracefully and hopefully with a sense of humor. I think that not enough is talked about when it comes to men dealing with chronic illness. Uh, chronic illness is more common in women. Uh, we don't know why exactly, obviously, genetics and DNA, stuff like that. But beyond that, we don't know why. So um, there's that. But also, women are socialized to talk about our feelings more, whereas men are not. They're told also that they must always be strong. And so then showing this weakness is, can be really hard. And that's not to say this is easy for anyone else. Obviously it's not. Women face all kinds of problems. Uh, there's a lot of sexism in medicine. Um, Non-binary folks have a whole host of other issues. But I think that so often we think that men have it easier in life, in the world. And in a lot of ways men do. But in this way, I think there's this extra struggle that isn't talked about. And there's that extra layer of it not being talked about because men are told not to talk about these things. So I think Brett did a really great job of laying this all out there. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that he did that and that I was able to include that piece in my book. And I will say too, um, when it came to di a diverse array of authors, I struggled to find men. Um, that was really tough actually. Um, and it was very frustrating. I got a lot of submissions, way more than I expected, but it was still hard to, to get men. Uh, to submit pieces. So I'm glad that, uh, that several of them did. Okay, I'm gonna read another piece and please do get those questions ready. Throw them in the Q&A anytime. You can put them in as anonymous if you want. Okay, so the next piece is uh, from Chronically Ill Teens by Michaela Shelley in Spartanburg, South Carolina in the US. And she wrote, I think people often for teenagers. We aren't adults yet, but we aren't little kids either. We can understand what the doctors are doing to us and why. Sadly, what comes with that is knowing that sometimes we are going to have to feel worse before we can feel better. We are sick at a time in our lives where otherwise we feel invincible. We think nothing can ever stop us in this world and then boom, life picks you out of nowhere and you are stuck in a position where you don't have a choice. Life isn't in your control anymore. As teenagers, we want to have that control and without that, it makes it hard to cope. Teenagers can understand what's happening even if we don't fully get it. We don't have the experience adults have, which can make things confusing and complicated at times. All these emotions get mixed up in our heads and we become frustrated and angry. Even adults know it is hard keeping emotions in check. Being sick and dealing with the added emotions on top of trying to manage normal teenage aspects of life is quite the ordeal. What if you needed someone to help you get, get up to go to the bathroom, to walk, to shower, to give you your needed medications, to take you to your doctor's appointments and to have someone and to have someone be there at the hospital with you during your stays almost around the clock. I think that's difficult for a grown adult to grasp, much less a teenager. 
we are at an age where we are gaining more independence than we have than we ever have before. Going out with friends without your parents, driving, heading off to college and building a life for yourself. Just imagine being 14 or 18 and suddenly having everything stripped from you. All your newfound independence is gone. I'm gonna skip ahead in her piece here. All I'm asking is that you don't forget us. Treat us like any other teen would be treated. Just understand that we may not be able to do everything our peers can. Sometimes it might be hard for us to express how we feel when so many emotions overwhelm us. It can be hard for us to share with you exactly how we feel because most days we don't even know. We are not adults and we are certainly not children. Our lives differ very much from them and how you need to treat the disease and how you need to treat us. It's certainly a crazy journey and it is not an easy one either. All I ask is that you treat us like any normal teenager, be willing to help us along the way and also give us some space. That's the only thing we truly want. I think that she just did such a great job there. It is hard experiencing this as a younger person. Um, and as she said, when you're a teenager, you're not a little kid, you're understanding enough. Um, and you're at a point in your life where you want that independence and it can be so hard not to have that. And um, I'm glad she lent us that insight into that perspective. So I do want to point out a lot of these are intense um, and there's some negativity here. There's also a lot of positivity in the book. Um, it can be hard to condense that into the length necessary for um, a presentation like this because you know there needs to be some more backstory shared. Um, but they are intense. I think they still have value. And I think it's really uh, great if you can read through them in full. The Minuteman Library, by the way, does have multiple copies of the book. The Carey Library um, doesn't at the moment, but they, I believe, are going to get one. Um, and I don't believe the Minuteman system has the ebook, but you can request it and maybe they'll get it. Uh, but they do have the paperbacks. And if you are in the Minuteman system, just remember you can order the book to be sent from any of the other libraries, even if your local one doesn't have it. Um, and I'm going to share a link here also um, where you can get the book directly yourself if that is something you'd like to do. Okay, so while I do have more to talk about, I could talk about this all night. Um, I also think this could be a good time for Q&A. So, um, you know, I, I know that it can be hard for some people to have to chat in the type, but <laughs> type into the chat box, into the Q&A box. Please do the best you can with that. Um, you should see a little Q&A option at the bottom of your screen or in your menu there. Um, so please feel free to ask absolutely anything that comes to mind. So I can ask a couple questions while we let people do their thinking. Um, I'm gonna try to pin both of us just struggling a little bit with your your separate audio so i'm just going to keep you Sorry spotlighted and people can just look at you and i'll um hide away so um, for those who are curious my audio input doesn't work on my computer and so i have a second device for audio and that's why there were some issues because i'm logged in at both at once so i apologize to everyone for that um it, yeah, it's the, unfortunate the recording for youtube will be good so if anyone wants to rewatch the beginning and be able to um see Julie talk about um, all that stuff at the beginning. You can check the YouTube later. But um, I was just thinking you kind of touched on this when you were talking about um, struggling to get men's point of views for your stories. And how did and then you talked about how you got a lot more submissions than you thought you were going to get. How did you like cast the net for all of these stories? Like how did the project kind of take off? So it was, um, it started with a, just posting to social media out into the void, hoping that something would happen, um, talking to my friends, talking to family, asking everyone to share, you know, the, the usual things and slowly word spread just a little bit. Um, I think that there were a couple of things that really had a big impact. One was a blog for writers picked it up. Um, and I have no idea how that person found it, but they said that they, but they had a little section on their website, places you can submit writing. And, um, they listed it there just said anyone with chronic illness is welcome to submit. And I got quite a few from there. And even people I knew personally said, Hey, I just saw your piece so over here. Um, but it took a while. It took about nine months to get the first half. 
Um, and then the rest just rolled in really fast. It was a lot of word of mouth to a lot of people within the chronic illness community, just telling other people. Um, I mean, I even posted on Craigslist, uh, but yeah, social media mostly, I think. And were a lot of the people, I'm just curious now, were a lot of the people that submitted, are they kind of writers by trade or did they just see the opportunity to get their story and their feelings and their experiences out there and they just wrote something for this? There was definitely a mix. Um, there were a couple of people, just a few, I can't remember how many who'd been professionally published. Um, quite a few more had blogs and so they were used to writing about chronic illness and that that was really helpful it's helpful to be used to talking about this but i'd say the majority of people um didn't have that experience they just had stories that they wanted to share and i was really glad because i did talk to some people who i knew personally who were put off by this idea well i'm not a writer and i really had to encourage them no 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 it's going to be professionally edited don't worry about that just put your words to paper we'll take it from there so I was really grateful to the people who were um, willing to take that risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's amazing that you gave people this platform to share their stories, because I think a lot of times, um, you know, it's hard to get your own personal experience out there and, you know, in a polished format like what you did. Um, so I, I just think, I mean, the book is so crucial and important to read. And um, I mean, like you said, it's when you're reading super personal stories, it's almost makes it easier to see parts of yourself in it as opposed to vague um, things. So um, just thank you so much for the book and for talking with us today. Um, it, it was really interesting and informative reading it and, um, and listening to you. And I'm going to keep going with my questions. Um, please okay. submit any you have to the chat. Um, Julie, I know you saw someone had said, um, I'm attending to learn how to support others with chronic illness. So why don't we kind of transition into that and how can we best support those that we love or even, you know, strangers around us, um, that are dealing with chronic illness. Yeah. And actually I was going to ask that person, they post anonymously and whoever you are, I'd love it. If you post a little bit more about what it is you'd like to learn, I'd love to be able to touch on that a bit more specifically. Um, when it comes to supporting loved ones, ask them, you know, our needs are all so different. And I think it's really important to give people agency, ask somebody, um, what they need help with. It, it depends too, if you're talking in a specific instance or in a larger sense, if I'm going to somebody's home, I might say, would you like me to do a load of laundry for you? Because saying, do you need help is so vague. And sometimes that adds so much pressure. Um, sometimes we don't feel well to even well enough to even think about what we might need. But if somebody says, can I make you uh, dinner tonight? Oh, well, sure, make me dinner, okay. That could be an easy yes. So offering something specific can be really helpful, especially if it's something that you know the person is struggling with. Um, it can also be helpful to just let them know in a more broader sense, hey, if you ever need to ride to a doctor's appointment or a babysitter, please let me know. Um, I always tell people, I'll tell you no if I can't do it, so never hesitate to ask because so often we do struggle to ask. And so whenever I say that, I think it makes it a lot easier for people. They know I will, I will honor my own boundaries and I'll say no, so therefore it will never be a burden. I'm making that very clear. Um, so be sure to let people know that too, that you won't offer unless you really mean it. It's different when we're talking about coworkers or strangers where you can't always ask. I think that when I, what I said before, I always believe people. I think that's key. There are going to be people who lie or exaggerate. Sure. I mean, there are in basically any part of our world, right? Um, but that's not the majority. So for the most part, if somebody is struggling and they're saying they need help, they need an extra day off work, um, whatever it might be, don't question it. Don't say, but didn't you just go to the doctor last week? Yeah, probably. I, I have more doctor appointments in a month than most of my peers have in a year. That's just my reality. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the ways that we can help too are just common sense politeness. Hold the door open for someone, whether they're struggling or not. It's a nice thing to hold the door open for someone. But if you see somebody struggling, somebody especially with a mobility device, 
holding a door open could be that extra bit of help. Um, when I am unloading groceries from my car and I'm parking in the disabled spot, I can't tell you how great it is when people say, hey, can I take that cart back for you? Great, then I don't have to walk. So those extra little things can actually help a lot. Um, and I think that it's something that might seem small and insignificant to you can make a big difference to someone. So if your first thought is, ah, this won't really matter, offer anyway. If the person says no, move on with your day. But if they say yes, then you just help them out. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. And if I can just poke at, um, you had said when people, you know, it's nice for people to to ask, oh, can, can I do this or can you do this? And you said, I know my boundaries, I'm gonna say no. As someone who struggles with upholding boundaries, how did you get to that point where you just, you know yourself and you're, yeah, you can stick to it like that? Um, that's a good question. It, it didn't happen overnight. I think that my chronic illness did have a lot to do with that because I finally had to learn I can't do all the things that, not just all the things I want to do, but all the things I would expect my body to be able to do at my age, at whatever age that was. This was also true 15 years ago. So um, I had to accept that. But the thing is, we all have boundaries. We all have limitations. None of us can just go endlessly, right? So I think the sooner we can accept that we can't do everything, then it's a question of saying, okay, what are my priorities? And if I'm going to do the most important things, then something else has to go. And I have to say no to the something else. And when, for those of us with chronic illness, the scales just might feel a little imbalanced. We have to say no to a lot more things. Um, there's actually, there are two pieces in the book. One is, um, they're by Glennis Scrivens, and I am blanking on the exact wording of the pieces. Um, but, oh, forgive yourself for saying no and forgive yourself for saying yes. And in those pieces, this is what she talks about, about um, forgive yourself for saying yes is accepting that sometimes we need help. We have to say yes when someone offers help, even when our pride or stubbornness or unwillingness to accept our own limitations makes us want to say no. We, we need to be able to say yes. And forgive yourself for saying no is sometimes you have to say no even to things you want to do. Um, she talks to me about attending a family wedding and attending a birthday party for a close friend. And as much as she wanted to do those things, she had to accept her limitations there. So I think that, yeah, it just comes back to you can't do everything. So you have to choose. And it's okay to say no. I think. A lot of us have a fear that if we say no to people, they're going to hold it against us. And what I can tell you is I regularly honor my own boundaries. I have never had anybody get reasonably mad at me. I've definitely had a couple of people get mad at me in unreasonable ways, which says more about them than it does about me. But I've never had anyone get mad at me as a person. They might just be mad at the situation. What I have had is multiple people say, Thank you for setting your boundaries. Thank you for taking care of yourself. Can you teach me how to do that? Thank you for reminding me I need to get better at setting my own boundaries. I have actually had people say this to me over and over and over. I have not been criticized and I've never felt that I hurt somebody's feelings. So if that gives you, whoever's watching, a little bit more reassurance, try setting that boundaries. Try honoring it and saying no at some point and you might be surprised. And when you do it once, it gets a lot easier. It's like with anything, the first time is the hardest and then it gets easier. Thank you for that answer. I, I do repeatedly need, you know, those reminders that it is good to set boundaries. Um, so going back to your book, I would love to hear about how you kind of processed through the submissions that you got. I mean, it, it must have been so hard to I'm assuming you had to choose ones to include in the book since it seems like you submissions picked up towards the end. Yeah, so um, I know somebody who had done a couple of anthologies and I took her out for coffee and picked her brain. She suggested, um, having done a couple of different links, she said, aim for 50, aim to get 100 submissions and use 50. That was her advice, great. And I struggle to get that 100 and then they came in so fast at the end that by the time I shut everything down and closed out submissions, I had already gotten, I think, closer to 150. Uh, oops. So there were a lot to choose from. And what made it very difficult for me 
was I never knew what I was going to read and how much it was going to affect me. So I had to really make sure I was in the right frame of mind because some of these pieces uh, were could be very difficult to read, um, very emotional. And I also couldn't read more than three or four in a sitting. And maybe I could do one sitting a week, maybe two. It's just where my health was at at the time. So it was very slow to read through them all. You know, I'd wait for the day. I'd be like, okay, I'm feeling emotionally strong. I'm feeling physically able. I'm going to sit and I'm gonna read some pieces, make my notes. And I had a whole bunch of notes for each one. And by the time I read through all of them, and I had to remember the earlier ones. So some pieces were very easy um, to filter in or out. Some were harder. And when I got to the end, I said, okay, here's how many I have. I have too many. Then it was, okay, here are two pieces on a very similar topic. How do I choose? And a lot of it did come down to trying to get that diverse array of voices and a diverse array of perspectives. It was hard. Um, I did have somebody else, a great volunteer who read through them as well, because I wanted somebody else's perspective on it. Um, there was a piece I couldn't relate to at all. I was like, this doesn't even feel like anything to me. She said, oh my gosh, that, that resonated. And there was one she said that just was nothing her did. It just, just didn't even seem real. I'm like, no, that is very real. I have that same issue that, that that's me. I could have written that piece. So it was really good to have somebody else to bounce those ideas off of. Um, but it was just, just a really long, long process. Um, I was very clear up front with all of the people who submitted pieces. This was going to be a long, slow process because I needed to work around my health issues. And a great thing is because everyone submitting pieces has chronic health issues, they understood. So I didn't have a single person pushing me on deadlines or anything. Um, publication took way longer than I expected and nobody was upset by that at all. So um, I, I was really just so impressed with how um, understanding and respectful everybody was. Uh, looks like there's a question here. What has helped you come to peace and acceptance of your chronic illnesses? Therapy, I'll be honest. And I know not everybody has access, um, but I am a big proponent and I wish I'd done it many years sooner. Um, I went out of my way to find a therapist who had experience working with people with chronic illnesses. Um, Personally, I just went on this, uh, I'm in the US, so you know your mileage may vary depending on where you are. I went on the Psychology Today website and I filtered for chronic illness um, and I just started calling and I found people who said, oh sure, I've worked with people with chronic illnesses. I think one of my patients has diabetes. I'm like, yeah, but no, no, no. That means you know somebody with a chronic illness. It doesn't mean you understand the nuance. Um, I ended up finding someone who had worked as a social worker in a hospital specifically with people with chronic illnesses and she gets it. Um, she gets it better than I do in a lot of ways. So um, I feel very fortunate to have found somebody and that has helped a lot. Beyond that, time has helped um, and finding things that I can do. I know it sounds cliche, but looking at what I can do instead of what I can't do, I cannot walk five miles. Can't do it, not gonna happen, um, but I can take a shorter walk. I can sit outside on a bench and enjoy the cool air. Um, I can sit and read a book and just fall in love or hate with the characters. I'm very mad at the characters in the book I'm reading right now. It's not good. Um, I just, I really wanna tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, and I can get very involved in that even on a day where maybe I can't go out and interact with, you know, the real human beings that I want to interact with. Um, it's not always good enough but it helps to see those positives. Um, for me also tangible things help. So the book is a very tangible thing and I knit and crochet and making something um, that has been really huge because at the end, even if I had to spend a few hours watching TV cause I couldn't do anything else. If I am up to knitting, hey, look, maybe I spent a few hours watching TV, but look, I have part of a scarf here. Um, and so I produced something. So whatever that might be for you, um, I'd say just look for something that brings you some joy, even if it's just a spark, even if it's just occasional, look for something small and build from there, right? Let's, we're not trying to like jump ahead here. We're not trying to jump to level 20 off out of the gate, start at level one um, and, and build up from there. Um, it's not easy, but it, it, it does come. Um, and I, I hope that you can find that soon. Um, 
Any other and questions, folks? Oh, I can I can transition from your answer there. Um, you talked about how it was a long kind of process, um, both with the book and then also kind of coming to accept your own reality. How did creating the book, reading these stories kind of help with that? Did you lose kind of faith in the book because it was taking so long or were the submissions helping you continue? What was it like just kind of creating the book? I'm laughing because audience, um, I gave Susan a bunch, bunch of questions and said, hey, if no one asks any questions, can you just get the ball rolling? And then she's coming up with these amazing questions I would never have thought of and making me really think here, which is wonderful and I love it and it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, so it took six years to publish the book. So that's a long time. I mean, it's a long time, it's six years, but also it's a long time in terms of changes in health. Um, you know, I think it can be hard sometimes to think back and like remember what it was like before the book. Um, like I said, some of the pieces just resonated so strongly. I, I went into this wanting other people to just feel understood. Um, but, you know, I felt that way too. I read things and went, oh, wow, that's not just me. Okay. I, this other person feels the same way. This other person has had this experience. And that was really amazing. Um, for me though, I can't separate out the community that came with it. I was already blogging anonymously as I'd mentioned, and I had a small community there. But with the book, suddenly there were all of these authors I was interacting with, and I started getting followers on the website, on my email list, and it it just it built up that feeling of being part of something, not being so alone. Um, that really helped a lot. I'm going to be honest; um, my brain fog kicked in a little bit there, and I forget all of pieces of your question. So I, I will need you to reiterate if there are pieces I didn't answer or if I went completely off the rails, you can tell me that too. No, I, I think it's all related. I was just kind of asking, um, you know, what the process was like making the book. And um, since you said it had been a long process, how did you stay committed to the end result? Ah, okay. Um, so the end result, uh, I think that it's, I do want to write um, a book that's my story. I think it's probably a good thing for me. I didn't start there because I am somebody who we, oh, we all have our motivations. For me, it's I don't want to let other people down. So every time I was really tempted to quit, I just felt like I can't do this. I was like, oh, but wait, there are all these people who I promised I'm going to do this. They're the other authors. They're all the people who said they want to read the book. I have to do it for them. So that was my motivating factor. Even when I felt really stuck, um, you know, it helped to have people I could talk to, bounce ideas off of. But when I just felt like giving up, it always came back to, mm, there are people who are counting on it. I got to do it for them. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be harder when I do write my own book. I need my own motivation, but it helps, helps for them. Um, so that was the second part of the question. The first part was um, about the process of creating the book. Um, the process of creating the book. So I knew going into it, I wanted an anthology and I had a really good idea of some aspects I wanted to include, topics I wanted to touch on. So when I was sorting through the stories, I was looking for, okay, I want someone who talks about discrimination in the medical office. I want to, us to have a discussion about benefits or lack thereof. You know, there are certain things I want to make sure we touched on. Um, and I didn't re write my own pieces until I'd chosen all the other pieces for the book because I wanted to be able to fill in the gaps. Um, and then as it turned out, I didn't need to fill in the gaps because people wrote about these things and they wrote excellent pieces about these things. So I was free to write whatever I wanted. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, there was just, there was a lot going into it. There were long periods of delay to where I would just suffer from insecurity um, or my health would take a dive and I'd need to wait. Um, that's what's happening right now. I was going to launch a Kickstarter in January to fund the production of the audiobook. And I was working on that campaign. I made great progress. Everything was looking good. And then um, right now I'm dealing with some new health stuff and I, I can't do any of it. I've had to step back 
from the stuff I was doing before. I certainly can't add to it. So, um, you know, that happened with the book too, unfortunately, which is part of why it took so long. But I also found a writing group, um, a writing collective, and they started up a group uh, for people who wanted to self-publish. And I always knew I wanted to self-publish. I never wanted to go the traditional route. And um, I see it's getting late, so I'll, I'll wrap this up. But um, working with other people who are trying to self-publish was so helpful. We learned so much from each other and we just supported and encouraged each other so much. Um, highly recommend if you're trying to dive into any difficult thing, um, find other people doing it also. Well, I, I think that's a great way to end it. And, you know, I was going to ask you kind of what's next for you and you kind of got into that. Hopefully the the audiobook is, um, I won't say hopefully, I think you've, you've proven with the process that the book took that, you know, it might not be tomorrow, but the audiobook is coming. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for um, taking the time to join us today um, and all of life's craziness. Um, I think this has been a really important conversation that we haven't had at the library before, at least while I've been here. Um, so again, um, thank you, Julie, so much for talking with us. Um, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. This is going to be recorded and posted on the library's YouTube channel. And um, in the recap email for everyone that registered, I'm going to post again um, the links that Julie has been sharing with us and anything else that she wants to include. Um, Julie, was there anything you wanted to say to add to the sign off? Um, just thank you so much. And I'm really glad that um, you provided this opportunity for more people to learn more about chronic illness. And um, there is a bonus at the back of the book, um, how to complete a big project while living with chronic illnesses. And I put the link to that um, in the chat. I guess that will be added to things later also so that anybody watching this um, can check that out. And um, yeah, hopefully it will be helpful as you're trying to complete a big project. I've had to reread it and remind myself what I wrote as I try to work on the audiobook so I can take my own advice. And I go, whoa, I was smart back then. So um, hopefully you'll find something useful. Thank you again for having me tonight. Of course. Thank you so much, Julie, and everyone have a happy holiday season and a good night. Thank you so much.